Good morning, guys. Um, let's go ahead and get started. I've got 53 slides I need to get to. So I'm going to be flying this morning. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we will uh, we will get started this morning. Lord, thank you so much uh, just for this opportunity that we have. Thank you, Lord, for just who you are, for your grace and your kindness given to us. Thank you for the, for the rain. And um, pray, God, that this would be beneficial. This would be uh, instructive. And uh, that overall, Lord, you would be glorified. We give you so much. We give you praise. We thank you so much for us in your son's name. Amen. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and jump into this. First of all, um, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Ken for the uh, for the gift. I don't usually wear these, right? Big big ups to you. Yes, yes, I see you. Um, yeah, I, I will never wear this outside of this place because people will look at me and go, right. <laughs> But I really do appreciate the gift. That it was it was very thoughtful and intentional. Okay, let's go ahead and review uh, what we talked about last week. Last week uh, we had ended chapter three, and basically the summation is Kohalath, that is Solomon told the congregation of the nation of Israel that since they cannot know their own personal life from event to event, remember chapter three is about our personal lives, the events that occur uh, with the activities that we do under the sun on the land that we live in. And since no one can know their personal life from event to event, from sequence to sequence, and since Kohalath made a, a comparison between human beings and animals, he does not call human beings animals. He simply makes a comparison between uh, the fact that, that both animals and human beings die the same way. They share the same event, the same sequence. That because of these things, that one should live intentionally with the God of Israel in mind. That the only time that we have really is today. It's the only time we've got. The past is gone. The future has, yet occur, has not yet occurred. And so what we do now is important, right? And that's what Kohalath kind of brings up. He also mentions that the mundane, regular, vanilla activities in life is what God delights in and approves of. God does not want us conquering mountains. He doesn't want us slaying giants, whatever we think the giants are. Um, um, he doesn't want us... Uh, to live audaciously, to have radical faith, right? He just wants us to live very plain Jane, vanilla lives, right? Kohalath emphasizes that for the human being, fear of missing out is a poor perspective to have. Um, um, really, if you have a perspective that you are to be doing things that are very plain, you're not going to miss out on anything. As a matter of fact, you'll, you'll have tons to do, right? Uh, tons to get to, right? Kohalath mentioned that the activities at the present time that are approved by God that he has established, a person ought to spend their time on, right? Not future. It doesn't mean we can't make plans, um, but it does mean that we need to consider uh, God in the activities that we do and to realize that he has given them to us for us to do and for us to enjoy. And then lastly, Koalath reminded the reader that life is short. So a person ought to be satisfied with the activities that a person is doing now is to have a proper perspective. Okay. Death is not a friend. It is not a, 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 a warm blanket, right? Death is a foe to be vanquished. Right. And so instead of focusing on trying to do great things or big things or building a legacy to to interact with those who matter to us in our circle. To be intentional about the way we live. That is very important to Kohala. Now, let's turn our attention to chapter four, verse one. 
And this is, I would say, this is probably one of the darkest chapters in, in the book of Ecclesiastes, um, because we're going to talk about a topic that a lot of people, either they, they want to kind of sugarcoat or they don't want to talk about at all. Let's go ahead and take a look at chapter 4, verse 1, and we'll read this. Then I looked again at all the acts of oppression, which were being done under the sun. And behold, I, the tears, or I saw the tears of the oppressed, and that they had no one to comfort them. And on the side of their oppressors was power, but they had no one to comfort them. So Koheleth literally <laughs> writes that he turns his attention. Um, that I looked again, he literally turns his attention to address another subject of activity that occurs on the land under the sun. So he's going to look at another activity, another work of humanity that he sees under the sun. And he talks about the oppression or the acts of oppression. Ashuk is the Hebrew word here. It means to oppress or to, extort, or to extort a particular group of people. The root word for this word is a sock. Okay? This root word means to press upon, um, uh, uh, to, to oppress, to violate in some way, or to do violence. Okay? So when we're talking about this word oppression, it is, it is, to, it is to subjugate or to press upon a particular person. The, the word Kohaleth uses, Ashuk, in this passage underscores certain actions of taking advantage of a person either by manipulation, by compulsion, or by physical brute force. Okay? This is not a, uh, this is not a can you do, it is you're going to do or be done away with. You're going to be made to care, right? Even if you don't. This word occurs two other times in the Hebrew scriptures. It occurs three times overall. Let's take a look at some of the usages. The, 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 use, the first usage that we find is in the book of Job. Chapter 35, verses 8 to 9 which says the following, it says your wickedness is, is for a man like yourself and your righteousness is for a son of man because the multitude of oppressions, they cry out. They cry for help because of the arm of the mighty or the strong, right? So the reasoning is here is because uh, these individuals are being oppressed, they are crying out in anguish for help for assistance, for succor, things like that. In Amos chapter 3, verse 9, we see this word here used as well in the same, kind of the same understanding. Proclaim on the citadels of Ashdod and on the citadels in the land of Egypt and say, assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria and see the great tumults within her and the oppressions in her myth, the act of what they were doing to the people within those regions, right, causing great turmoil and pain. This is not a great word. It's not a fun word, right? It means exactly that, the crushing of one's group of people. This word is in the qual stem, which is active, and it's in the participle passive, which is used as an adjective, a descriptor. So it's the type of actions that are involved, which is why the, the term acts of oppression is translated here. The word describes, again, the works or activities specifically of these types of actions among men. Kohaleth looked at humanity and saw that humanity oppresses and crushes others. Manipulates, provokes violence, things of that nature. Then he tells us the result. And behold, 
focus. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. Again, tears, dimha, is the word here. Occurs 23 times in the Hebrew scriptures. It is translated tears exactly as you see it in the text. However, it's kind of interesting, though, that uh, if you go through this word, I looked at all 23 usages of this, of this word here, and this certain word that occurs in the Hebrew scriptures, fascinating, is the result of extreme emotional pain or distress from events that are intense or extremely difficult, whether situational, whether it occurs, you know, uh, just something that happens, you know, afflictions, pressures, things like that, or the result of an action when one does something to someone else. It is the result of extreme emotional distress and hardship. So the act of oppression, the, the result of it is the tears of the individuals who are subjugated under these people who are crushing these individuals, manipulating them, exploiting them, extorting them. Again, let's take a look at the word comfort. This is the word naham. It occurs 108 times in the Hebrew texts, and it means, uh, depending on the context of where it's found, it could be it could be comforted. It can mean to reconsider, um, to to change one's mind. It could be used in that way too. Um, it could be it could be to, to be apologetic or sorry or to have extreme regrets. In the context of chapter 4, verse 1 of the book of Ecclesiastes, Koaleth uses this word, this specific word, to discuss the person who was oppressed, that Koaleth saw, that he witnessed with his own eyes, did not receive any sort of solace, did not receive any sort of peace, any sort of of, of tranquility of mind, so to speak, from any of those who oppress them. They are victims in this case. And it is expressed in their response. Koaleth asked the congregation of Israel to turn their attention and focus on the on his observation concerning the activity of oppression on those who were victims and the result is tears physical and emotional pain on the other end kohalath makes an observation concerning those who oppress not just the oppressed not, not just the oppressed but those who actively are involved in this activity it says and on the side of their oppressors was power and an interesting statement that coalesce makes but they had no one to comfort them that isn't that interesting let's talk a little bit about this statement the word power the, again, the oppressed and the oppressors is the same root word as the oppression. The word power is koach. It occurs 127 times in the Hebrew scriptures. And this word occurs one other time in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 10. Koholath, basically summing up all of his findings here at this point of the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 9, he writes this. He says, whatever your, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. That word might, translated in my scriptures, is this word, koach, power. For there's no activity or planning or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol where you are going, Right? So this word here, this, this word can be translated strength, 
um, uh, uh, physical strength, ability, might, power, influence, right? Authority, things like that. Okay. This function is to express or use one's physical strength, right? Their energy or their influence to achieve a goal or perspective. Okay. So these individuals, these people who are oppressing, they have authority, they have influence. Whether it be, or they may use physical strength based upon their influence to crush those who uh, they oppress. Koheleth in verse one and two. Uh, this is verse one, I'm sorry. Koheleth in verse one brings up the activity of humanity under the sun as it relates to two groups of people. To those who are being crushed by people with power. And those who have power crush those who do not have this influence. As a result, both are not comforted. Both are not. How is that possible? The people who are crushed are not comforted because they lose everything to the one who subjugates them. The individual who is oppressing is using their power not to serve anyone but themselves, but to crush the weak. The one in power is not comforted because all they seek is that. And they exercise it against those whom they ought to serve. That's the point. They're not comforted because all they seek is power. Not to serve others with it, but to serve themselves. Koheleth would be very uh, familiar with this, considering that he is an influence in the nation of Israel. He interacts with other people or other uh, people of influence around the, surrounding the nation of Israel, he would be well aware of this fact. We see this all throughout the Hebrew scriptures as well. I, would, I think of Pharaoh and how he treated the, uh, uh, the, the, the Hebrews, the Israelites, overburdening them with, uh, uh, with work and not giving them the supplies they need to fill these things. The power isn't the issue. The perspective of one that obtains power and uses it to crush the weak is the issue. Even in the law of Moses, you have the ordinances that they were to care for the orphan and the widow. I find it very fascinating that those outside of the nation of Israel who didn't have the law, how did they treat the orphan and the widow? They would crush them. They would pulverize them. They would use their power to destroy them. This is Kohaleth's conclusion. As a matter of fact, we see this all throughout Kohaleth's writings, as a matter of fact. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 10, he writes, When it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. And when the wicked perish, there's joyful shouting. Why? Because those who are wicked don't acknowledge anything righteous. As a matter of fact, they crush the righteous. In Proverbs 28, verse 12, when the righteous triumph, there is great glory. But when the wicked rise, men hide themselves. Men hide themselves. Same, same chapter, verse 28. Same, same similar thing. When the wicked rise, men hide themselves, but when they perish, the righteous increase. Even in the book of Ecclesiastes itself, Kohaleth makes mention several other times about this particular ideology, this perspective. 
In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 8, a chapter over, he writes this, if you see oppression, if you see oppression of who? The poor. No one ever oppresses a rich person because they've got the resources, right? They oppress the poor. And denial of justice and righteousness in the province, do not be shocked at the sight for, for one official or high one watches over another official and there are higher officials over them. Man, doesn't that sound like a governmental system we know? It's not my fault. I didn't do it. I was told this, right? In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 7, for oppression makes a wise man insane and a bribe corrupts the heart this is why bribes were not accepted or they ought not to be accepted because it blinds one from justice it corrupts the thinking the mind this is an activity that occurs throughout the land of men throughout the activities in the world that we live in. And, and Kohaleth is observing this. He comes to this conclusion in verse two. So I congratulated the dead who were already dead more than the living who were still living. Kohaleth, based on the previous observations about this activity says that those who have died are commended by Kohaleth than those who are alive and are still living they're better off because they don't have to deal with any of this okay? however he makes another observation that's even more startling than this one in verse three he says but better off qualitatively good than both of them is the one who has never existed, who has never seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. He says better than the person who wasn't even born. Why? <clears throat> because the person who has not lived has not seen nor experienced the evil that is, in this context, oppression under the sun which is Kohaleth's idiom here. They're referring to the activity on this land. As I mentioned before, this is probably one of the darkest chapters in the book of Ecclesiastes. When you begin to look at this, this is not a pleasant one because it shows us that, that aside from all the kind of pleasantries that we've seen throughout chapters one and two and three, he mentions that we should enjoy our labor and it is good. But Kohalath in chapter four, right out the starting gate, holds no punches for this particular reality. He's bringing it to you straight, no chaser, right? A sobering reality of the activities of men. He continues in chapter four, verse four, and says this, I've seen that every labor and every skill which is done is a rivalry between man and his neighbor. This too is vanity and striving after the win. What does it mean that it's done of rivalry? Does that mean we shouldn't have any sports teams? I joke, of course, because I have a jersey that you guys don't like. <laughs> And a jacket that I wear proudly that you guys don't particularly favor. Wrong team, right colors, right? <laughs> Let's talk about this word a little bit for a minute. This is an interesting word, rivalry. The word is kana, okay? Uh, it occurs 43 times in the Hebrew scriptures. It is used two times in the book of Ecclesiastes, and it is 
translated in various passages as zeal, okay, passion, okay, or jealousy. Okay? It is used all throughout the law of Moses. It is also used in the prophets, in the prophetic writings. It's, it's all over the place. Okay? The root word for this word is kana, okay, which means jealous, to be jealous or to be envious. Now, we have to be careful when we see words like these within their context because sometimes this word involves the activities of another, a human to human, right? Um, sometimes it describes the outcome of something. For example, if uh, there's one such law in the nation, in the law of Moses, that if you sleep with another person's wife, their husband will become envious. That's a problem, right? This word is also uh, used for God, too. Okay. Let's take a look at the usages of how it's used for God. Again, we have to be careful because God is not jealous in the same way that we could become jealous about superficial things, right? For instance, in Numbers 25, 11, concerning Phineas, it says, Phineas, the son of Elasar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel and that he was jealous with my jealousy among them so that I did not destroy the sons of Israel in my jealousy. Okay. We see this in Deuteronomy 29, 20 as well. The Lord shall never be willing to forgive him, but rather the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will burn against that man and every curse which is written in his book will rest on him and the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. Again, this is talking about the physical punishments of a person who engages in idolatry and divination and witchcraft and all of that. The Lord becomes jealous. Why? Because they are not acknowledging him as a nation or as a person or whatever. Okay? Isaiah 42, 13. It says, the Lord, the Lord will go forth like a warrior and arouse his zeal like a man of war. He will utter a shout. Yes, he will raise a war cry. Again, this is speaking of the future. Okay. So this word in the book of Ecclesiastes is not talking about God, but it's talking about the activities of humanity. To keep that in context and the oppression of this activity. So Koaleth wrote that in his observations concerning the activities of humanity in this context of oppression, this is a whole thought that Koaleth has, okay? The result is people acting out of their jealousy between a man and his neighbor. This is not talking about rival teams or anything else like that. This is talking about one, why individuals oppress. If one seeks power and you have power, well, that's not fair that you have it. Why should you have that? Koaleth once more makes a sobering observation about the nature of humanity and their activity. And those who conduct themselves in this way, those who oppress others do so out of jealousy they have for those whom they are ought to serve. You can't have children, but I have a bunch of them. You can't use electricity, but I can. I can use all of it I want. You can't fly, coach. Because you rack up too, you can't fly an airplane because you rack up too much carbon credits. But I can fly my jet that racks up twice as much as yours because I'm not you. They use their power to prevent people from either having what they themselves have or they will use their power to take away from those who have what they want. The outcome is the same. They will crush a person for this reason. That is the point. A 
Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 5. A fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. What a, what a, what a statement. What a statement here. What does this mean? And why does Coalef place this here? I mean, this seems out of place here, right? What are we talking about? All of a sudden, we're talking about uh, oppression and, 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 and you know, crushing individuals. And now we have this, this particular idiom, right? This statement, this proverb here by Kohalath. Let's discuss this word fool. This word fool is kasil. Yeah, this word occurs 70 times in the Hebrew scriptures. It's used 18 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. The first occurrence is in chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. Okay. Concerning the fool and the wise man, okay, and how they both alike die. It is fool, stupid, or foolish is the translation. And this word that describes these particular individuals carries with it certain characteristics, okay, that this individual who is described in such way acts and uh, um, uh, presents himself in such a way. Let's look at a couple of examples here. For instance, a child who outright rejects the practical wisdom of their parents, okay? That is the wisdom that God is trying, the, the, the wisdom that mom and dad are trying to teach them by the word and a child who outright rejects it. For instance, a foolish son is agreed to his father and bitterness to her who bore him. They make stupid decisions. Why did you do that, right? Number two, a person who actively rejects the wisdom and knowledge of God is also a casile. Okay. It says, for instance, do not speak in the hearing of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of your words. You give someone the wisdom of God, they don't want to hear it. They outright reject it. That person, by their quality and their character, by their activity, is a fool. Okay. Number three, a person who actively engages in violence is a fool. Proverbs 26, 6, he cuts off his own feet and drinks violence who sends a message by the hand of a fool. Okay? So one who engages in violence is foolish. And a person who lacks self-control and loses their temper Proverbs 29, 11, all written by the same author. A fool always loses his temper, but a wise man holds it back. He exhibits restraint, right? And lastly, a person who does not use their words intentionally and truthfully. A fool, fool's mouth is his ruin and his lips are the snare of his soul. So when Koaleth uses this word, he's not speaking in a general sense like we use it. You're just, why are you, why are you, why are you a fool? You know? He's not using it in a general sense. He's using this word to describe the characteristic and the quality of a person, particularly with these qualities. They are unintentional. They, they exhibit violence. They reject God's wisdom in their life overall they make stupid decisions and poor choices so what does this mean of the fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh I, what does that mean kohalath wrote that the fool embraces clasps his hands and eats his own flesh he, he eats it imagine that this statement is an idiom a saying that talks about the conduct and the result of the behavior of a fool. Notice all the characteristics and qualities that I mentioned have the purpose that they hurt and destroy themselves. There are many statements that underscore this. As a matter of fact, we will not look at uh, all of them, but we will look at some of them, a couple to be specific. In Proverbs 9, 
verses 30 to 31. It says, a merciful man does himself good, but a cruel man does himself harm. He hurts himself. Okay. He destroys his own self by his actions. Verse uh, chapter four, verse six of the book of Ecclesiastes. One handful of rest is better than two fistful of labor and a striving after the wind. Let's take a look at it. Nahat is the Hebrew word here. Occurs eight times in the Hebrew scriptures, three times in the book of Ecclesiastes, and it means quiet. It can mean rest depending on the context, or dissent, meaning that the judgment of God has come upon an individual and they have descended. This word is also, they've rested, essentially. They've been put down. Let's look at Proverbs again, again, written by the same author, Koheleth. He uses this, when a wise man, verse chapter 29, verse 9, when a wise man has a controversy with a foolish man, the foolish man either rages or laughs, and there is no rest. You know what? I'm going to, uh, I have comments about this, but I'm going to reserve those because we see this in a, a lot in our culture. But I'll just, I'll reserve that for private conversation. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 17. Notice how this word is used to contrast between the fool and the wise man. The words of the wise heard in quietness are better than shouting, than the shouting of a ruler among fools, right? So one hand full of rest is better than two fists full of labor. We still don't know what that means, but we do know this, that rest is quiet. This is, this is a, this is a, 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 um, a, a, uh, a disposition or an attitude type deal. It's not like I have to walk around and whisper like this. But it's, it is a disposition, a perspective. Two fists full of labor. Now, Koalath adds another idiom in the middle of this chapter. He mentions that one handful of rest, or quiet, really, is qualitatively good. That word better is tob. Again, we see this all throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. And then two fists, or handfuls, of labor. What I thought labor was a, was a good thing. Why is it in this context? I mean, isn't that, isn't that true? Well, let's discuss this word for a minute. The word labor is the word amal. <clears throat> um, we discussed this word previously in the, in, the, in the book of Ecclesiastes. It occurs 22 times. And it can be translated as trouble, toil, or mischief. Okay? When he says it's the grievous work, that the men, uh, that 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 men, uh, what happens? It, it is a it is a grievous work for men to be occupied with. In chapter one, this is the word amount. Okay, so this does underscore toilsome, overburdening labor, right under the sun. Okay. However, depending on the context, again, this word is is very contextual, in its in in where it's used because it doesn't necessarily mean labor everywhere you look at it within the Hebrew scriptures. For example, in Psalm chapter seven, verse 12 and 14, it says, if a man does not repent or reconsider, he will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow and made it ready. He's also prepared for himself deadly weapons. He makes his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, he travails with wickedness and he conceives mischief and bring forth falsehood. Why don't they translate that labor? Because that's not what's in the text here, right? That's the same word here, amal, in Psalm 7. In Proverbs chapter 24, verses 1 to 2, 
He says, do not be envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them, for their minds devise violence and their lips talk of labor. No, trouble, mischief, right? I'm out. So why is it translated labor in this particular text? Why can't it just be translated trouble, right? Well, I think the idea of the translators is they're trying to keep these words consistent throughout the book of Ecclesiastes based upon their observations. That's what I'm convinced. That's why they write the word labor here. But it really actually, to bring clarity to the text, it should be translated trouble or mischief. Well, why is that? Because this is the context of what it's talking about. It's talking about oppression and the acts of oppression and the result of oppression. And what happens when a person engages in this activity? They destroy others. They destroy themselves. They cause trouble. They cause mischief. Better one hand full of rest, a quiet disposition, than two fists full of trouble. Well, let's look, because we see it all over Kohalef's writings, as a matter of fact. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with it. Same structure, by the way, as this text in chapter 4. Better is a dish of vegetables where love is than a fattened act served with hatred. Better to be a vegetarian with the motive of love where a person loves you and serves you than be a a metasaurus and have strife and contention. Proverbs 16, 8, better is a little with righteousness than a great income with injustice. Doesn't that sound very familiar? It's within the same topic, the same subject. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 1, Better a dry morsel and quietness with it than a house full of feasting with strife. Same type of structure. It's not talking about labor, the two fists full of work. That's not what it's talking about. In, in context here, this is talking about the activities of the, oppress of the oppressor and the acts of oppression under the sun. Here's what I believe the conclusion is based upon these particular verses, verse 1 to 6. Kohaleth ends this line of reasoning. Remember, he's observing like a researcher does, looking at things very plainly and, and writing down their conclusions. Kohaleth ends this line of reasoning with his signature saying that it is striving after the wind. It is useless. It is a useless endeavor. It is profitless. The oppressor's activity and character serves no one under the sun. For those who seek power and crush others, they destroy themselves in the process. It is destructive. It is wicked and leads to physical and emotional pain and strife to those who are at the tip of the spear of oppression. And it destroys those who oppress as well. Ultimately, this person with this conduct, Kovaleth refers to as a fool. Oppression is a real thing. We see it all over. All over the land that we live on. And it's something that Kohaleth, it seems, wants the, the nation of Israel, as well as us who are reading and observing this, to be mindful of. That as long as we are here on this side of the rapture in Christ's appearing, this will continue to be a reality. 
not Pollyannish, but nevertheless true. And know that those who engage in this activity are foolish. Let's pray. These are hard, hard verses, sobering verses that Koheleth gives us, but they are true. That really, in reality, these acts and activity don't benefit anyone. They don't help anybody. And they do not promote righteousness at all. Lord, help us to have eyes to see that those who conduct these things, we should not be surprised or shocked that these things take place because this is, at this point, the reality of the land of men. And we thank you, God, for this sobering um, reminder of that fact. Thank you so much, Lord, for it's in your son's name. Amen.